very special thing. Uh, today, I'm going to continue a series of messages on stewardship, and, and really just to begin with uh, this statement, I own nothing. Say, well, Pastor, that sounds like you're really being a poor mouth here or something. But think about it. I own nothing. Say, you own nothing. Say, no, Pastor, that's not true. I can go home, I can look in my bank account. I can see the possessions in my home. But when you think about it, we all came into the world with nothing. We didn't bring anything with us. We were born. We had nothing. Everything we have, at some point or another, we were given by somebody. Maybe we worked, but who gave us the ability to work? God. So, so we, we have stuff, we steward stuff, we manage stuff during our lifespans here on this earth. And then one day... We go home to be with Jesus if we've trusted in Christ as Lord and Savior. And we go back to what in terms of our, all of the stuff that we stewarded or managed here upon this earth. Does it belong to us anymore? Not at that point. We didn't bring it with us. We're not going to take it with us. So really, it's better for us not to think in terms of us owning things that really belong to us. If, if the Bible is right when it says the earth is the Lord's and all it contains, then everything belongs to God and you and I are not really owners, but just for a span of life, for a period of time when we are alive on this earth, we are managers of that which belongs to God, belonged to Him before we came, will belong uh, to Him after we leave. Other people stewarded it before, other people will steward it after, but while we are alive, we are just managing that which ultimately belongs to God. Now, folks, that is a totally different picture uh, towards uh, possessions and wealth and all kinds of things than what you will see in our society today. People want to say, well, this, this person has a lot, this belongs to them. They have a lot of money or they don't have a lot of money. And, and we just have a different approach. There's a difference between stewardship and ownership. And that's really ultimately the basis behind understanding uh, stewardship issues. And we continue this series today. We've looked at that uh, in previous weeks. We looked last week even at the tithe, uh, tithing and giving, grace giving. And a lot of times when people, we talk about stewardship, people just think tithing. They're, well, God <clears throat> receives his 10% and then we can do whatever we want to with the other 90%. That's sort of the, the philosophy that people have. Well, guess what? God cares about the other 90% too. He wants us to use that in ways that will glorify Him. He wants us to be a good steward of that which He has provided for us. And today we're going to focus a little bit more specifically on just really what we need to do to be good stewards in our own homes, in our own households as we manage. The Bible has a lot to say about money. And here's something some people do. They'll take money matters and they'll put it over here in a certain category. They'll say, okay, God, I'm going to let you <clears throat> inform me from your word. I'm going to read scripture. I'm going to let you talk to me about faith. And I'm going to let you talk to me about forgiveness. And I'm going to let you talk to me about salvation. Uh, I'll even read what you have to say, Lord, about creation, about the beginning, about the end, uh, about how I'm supposed to live. God, you can talk to me about all of those things, but I'm going to put my, my money's over here. That's business, Lord. That, that's, that's not in the area of spiritual things. That's in the realm of, of financial things and business things and administrative things. And God, you, you don't have any business in my business. Well, guess what? God is Lord over everything. He is Lord over your heart. He's over, Lord over your relationships. He's Lord over your work. He's Lord over your family. He's Lord over your money. He is Lord over everything that is. And He is Lord over you. And so if we're really going to, to come to the Word of God uh, faithfully and openly and honestly and allow it to speak to our hearts, we can't have an area of our life where we say, okay, God, you can speak to me in these areas, but I'm not going to let you inform me about this matter. This is my separate thing over here. We, we really just cannot do that. 1 Timothy 5.8 says this, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. 
The idea here is that we are to care for those within the household, within our household, within our family. We're to care for family members. We are to be good stewards, and we are to uh, do all that we can uh, to take care of others. The Bible's very clear about our responsibilities within the family. And so I want to share just some, um, uh, some biblical principles today, really. Uh, these are uh, listed in a, a book uh, called The Art of Obedience by Dolores McKenzie, uh, 10 Biblical Financial Principles for the Christian Home. And I want to just uh, list these and mention these briefly before uh, discussing a little bit more about uh, our specific opportunities to show uh, stewardship through uh, the Missions First uh, program as well. But I've been, I've been talking about that during this stewardship campaign because it is such a new thing for us. But I want to just share 10 biblical financial principles for the home. Number one, God is our source. He is the source of all of our blessings and certainly even the source of all of our financial blessings. Philippians 4.19 says, My God will supply every need of yours according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Uh, you will have one picture if you think that your workplace provides for your needs, if you have uh, the view that you are responsible for providing for your needs, if you think that uh, someone else is responsible for your, uh, for your needs, another human being. We need to recognize that that what we have, ultimately we have, because God is Jehovah Jireh, God is our provider, He is the source of everything that we have. And once we recognize that, that yes, He owns it all, but He's also the source of everything in our lives. God meets our needs. Your bank account does not meet your needs. Uh, other people do not meet your needs. God is the one who provides for you. And we uh, accept that, embrace that as an act of faith. Number two, giving is essential. Now this is not giving to, through the church. This is talking about just general generosity in Luke 6, 38. Notice this verse. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now this is not just talking about uh, financial gifts through uh, the church or to the Lord. It's really talking about a lifestyle of generosity towards others. How tightly do we cling to that which we call our own? If we're stewarding that which really belongs to God, we ought to be open. We ought to, to hold that loosely and be willing to share that with other people. And what this really says is more or less what goes around comes around. If you're willing to be generous in your sharing with other people, if you're willing to, to give, if you're willing to be faithful in that way, guess what? That's going to return back to you. And that giving is not only financial, but it's in other ways as well. As we give love to other people, we receive love. As we give forgiveness to other people, we receive forgiveness. As we give kindness to other people, we receive kindness. As we share with other people, they will share with us. And what we find is that uh, the Bible urges upon us a generosity because Ultimately, if you think everything you have is, is, belongs to you and is yours, you hold to it tightly and, and you want to uh, earn all you can and can all you get and sit on the can and you just kind of keep it all for you. But God wants us to say, you know what? It's, it's his and we're to be stewards of it, which means we can share with others and, and be used of him in that way. Giving is an essential part of uh, our sharing. A, a, third, a third principle here is to live on a margin. Live on a margin. Here, the idea is to learning to expect the unexpected and to build some margin in our lives. And the way people often will describe this uh, is with time management rather than just financial management. And they'll say, well, listen, when you uh, get in the, the car to go someplace... Uh, if, uh, if it takes 30 minutes to get there, uh, do you le leave the house precisely 30 minutes before the time of the appointment? Uh, so, suppose someone does that. They don't put any margin in their life because they're supposed to be there in 30 minutes, so they leave 30 minutes ahead of time, right? And that always works out perfectly, right? No. What happens? Well, you go through Childersburg. Childersburg happens is what it is. You know, you go through 280 and, and there's no telling. There's uh, traffic and there's construction or something. Maybe there's an accident on the highway. Uh, maybe you just hit every red light. I mean, sometimes you hit every red light. Or in this town, what is very likely to happen? 
the train. Catch it coming and going. I'll go there. It's, it's coming. I say, all right, I'm going to go right. And I go right. The train, another train has come that way. I'll go left. Whichever side I go, that's where the train magically appears. It's just going to block me wherever I try to, to get through. But, but yeah, a train or something. Something will happen. And, you know, we can kind of expect. Now, now occasionally, maybe nothing will happen. So you get there a little early. That's it's no sweat. But we build a little margin in because of the unexpected. Now, you apply this financially. You get a paycheck. What do you do with that paycheck? If you spend it all, and you say, well, I'm going to do this, 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 this is going to go here, 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 and you don't have any margin, guess what will happen all of a sudden? Something will break down at your home. Something, gosh, for us this year, it was uh, the air conditioning unit just out of warranty. Oh, so anyway, you just, you know, so there you go. And, but, but, you know, we say these unexpected expenses come along. But why are they unexpected? Because we know that, that they're, they're going to come. Someone's going to have a, a, an injury or an illness, and you have a, an expense related to that, or uh, just, just something comes up. And so... So if we're really going to be wise in our stewardship, it, it, it really means that we, we plan for the unplanned. We expect the unexpected. We live on a margin and, 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 and leave a little room for uh, those things that might happen. Um, since my money, this is a John Hagee quote, and I will quote him today. I know he's very excited today because of the super wolf blood moon that's going to happen at midnight tonight. And anyway, if you don't know what that is, it's probably a good thing. That's just fine. Uh, it doesn't, I don't really put a whole lot of stock into that, but uh, uh, Brother Hagee kind of does sometimes. Anyway, uh, since my money is God's money, every spending decision I make is a spiritual decision. Think about that for me. If, if indeed it all belongs to Him and we're just stewards of it, then every time I spend anything... I'm making a spiritual decision as to what to do with that which God has provided for me. And that, that might change the way that we sometimes uh, invest our resources. Uh, number four, the Bible teaches saving. Uh, in Proverbs 21 and 20, it says, There is treasure to be desired and oil in the dwelling of the wise, but a foolish man spendeth it up. In other words, uh, if you're wise, you, you set aside, you live on that margin, you save up for a rainy day, that foolish person... It's like uh, they've got a, uh, just a hole in their pocket. They've got to spend that money. They get a little bit of money, and they, it's just burning a hole, and they have to spend it all, and then next thing you know, there is nothing for a, a difficult experience. Number five, avoid the debt trap. In Psalm 37 and verse 21, the wicked borrow and do not repay, but the righteous give uh, generously. Uh, we are... Uh, called to be faithful to the Lord in uh, our uh, financial dealings with other folks. And this issue of debt, the Bible uh, does not precisely, specifically, completely forbid all forms of it, but it never encourages it. And it, there are many verses like this that will discourage it. Uh, now for a house, for a car, uh, sometimes for education loans... Uh, those can be investments and it's a, a necessary, that's kind of a, a good debt if you can call it that. But many other forms are, are, are really bad debt. And uh, the Bible discourages us from getting into a position where uh, debts just uh, can overwhelm us. Proverbs uh, 22 and 7 says, The rich rules over the poor and the borrower is the slave of the lender. And if you've ever known the crushing uh, pain uh, of being overextended there financially, uh, there is a sense of being enslaved there. There is a, a burden, an oppressive sense, till uh, you get that uh, note paid off. Uh, learn to be content. That is a sixth biblical principle for our household. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. That's Hebrews 13, 5. Be free from the love of money. And the Bible doesn't say that money is bad. Money is not the root of all evil. The love of money. That, that greed it can be the root of all kinds of evil because people, when they are greedy for it, when they love it too much, they steal for it. They, uh, they fight for it. They do all manner of other things that are evil to try to get it. 
And uh, the fact of the matter is, money itself, not evil, but the love of it. We are to be content with what we have. And you think about it, uh, if you have a situation, you say, well, what, what can I do about, if you have a want, it might not even be a, a need, just a want or a desire, and, and you, you're sitting there and you say, well, you know what, I can't afford that thing. You basically have two options. Find some way to work and earn money appropriately, biblically, properly, and and then buy the thing, or don't buy the thing and be content with what you already have. And, and that contentment is a very important uh, process. It's a very important concept. It's a very important thing because uh, God has truly given all of us much more than we, frankly, than we uh, really need. Uh, it would be true that people all over the world would do anything that they could to get an American passport, even a fake one, so they could get into our country. There are people all over the world who would love to have what we have just being in this country and just experiencing uh, the blessings that we have. Uh, having gone on a few uh, international mission trips, uh, people think that Americans are rich. It's really odd. You go to another country, they assume that you're rich. And one of the reasons they assume that is because you can afford to, to travel to get over there. And so they just kind of have that perspective of everybody in America, uh, in, in many of these underdeveloped countries, everybody in America is rich. And I know that we have those uh, different uh, perspectives on, on the social status and everything else, but if we, if we really viewed things uh, the way that uh, the majority of people in the world do, if you have running water in your home, uh, if you have uh, certainly uh, indoor plumbing, air and heat, and uh, clean clothes and, and a job and food to eat. Uh, you know, <laughs> people all over the world would be like, oh, you've, you have got it so made. You, you really do. And frankly, even if we take things back, not to uh, just the underdeveloped world, uh, but you can even take it back to the developed world, but a few centuries ago. And, and if you compare the level of... Uh, of information that we have, the, the products that we have, the amount of food that we have, uh, the housing situation that we have. We, we frankly, we live like kings lived a few centuries ago. Uh, we may not have the same number of servants and whatnot, but in terms of, of comforts and that kind of stuff, we have uh, so much, and, uh, and we can be grateful for that. We need to be content with what we have. And then number seven, keep records and budget. I'm amazed at how many people just, I mean, they go through life. We have folks that will come here and request benevolence from the church sometimes. And, and they just, I don't know how they, 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 they manage because they really, they don't manage. The very first thing I would do is, is sit down and, and, and say, all right, what are my obligations every month? That's a normal billing cycle for most things. What do I have to pay each month? And I'm going to put these in a certain priority from most important to least important. And I'm going to pay these at the top first and uh, those down at the bottom if I can get to them. And I'm, I'm going to have a structure. I'm going to have a, a plan. Some people just kind of go through life and a bill comes. Oh, there's a bill. Well, I'll pay it. And, and it just seems like they don't have any comprehensive view of how that's going to be. Now, the Bible teaches we should be kind of aware of our expenses and our obligations. In Luke 14, it's actually in reference to a building pro project. It says, For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. In other words, take stock of your situation. Figure out where you are. Budget through that. Plan through that. Uh, keep records of what your expenses are likely to be and, and, and develop a plan for your household. Now, uh, some have uh, made recommendations on how you might uh, try to do that. I know that may be just absolutely impossible to read. Those are, uh, that's a basic uh, family uh, budget chart uh, that Dave Ramsey, uh, Christian financial uh, counselor, has uh, provided and, and, and recommends dividing up the pie more or less in this way 
And uh, to the right there you see ranges. On the left it just has specific amounts. But on the right he has ranges, and those ranges allow for a little bit of, of play, a little bit more in one category, a little bit less than in another. But basically we all need these things, and uh, he has de de defined this as a way of, of, of just developing your, your household budget and making sure that you can uh, meet your uh, obligations. Number eight, do not co-sign. Proverbs 22, 26 and 27 says, Do not be one who shakes hand and pledge or puts up security for debts. If you lack the means to pay, your very bed will be snatched from under you. All right, you don't want to have your bed repossessed, your furniture repossessed in your house. And the idea here is this, that, that when you co-sign for somebody else, in other words, what, what, what that bank is saying to that other person is, you don't have uh, enough credit for me to lend you the money personally. So the reason they get you to co-sign is that the other person cannot pay themselves. And so if you co-sign, then basically you're buying that thing or you're agreeing to buy that thing if they don't. And listen, many times they don't. So the Bible discourages. Uh, the Bible is, is kind of neutral. on it, it discourages debt, but it doesn't completely forbid it. The Bible really does say that we are really not to co-sign uh, or, or do this. It is, uh, it is a very unwise thing for us to do. And then uh, we're to work hard. Uh, a hard worker has plenty of food, but a person who chases fantasies ends up in poverty. 20, uh, Proverbs 28 and 19. Or this, for even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, don't let him eat. 2 Thessalonians 3.10. How's that? Now again, it's not, not talking about those who have disabilities, those who cannot work. That's one thing. We certainly want to care for those who cannot work. But there's a difference between cannot work and will not work. And the Bible could not be any more clear about this, that we are to be willing to work. Uh, and that is uh, that the, the, the basic Protestant work ethic that used to be very strong in American culture and society is not so much uh, anymore. But the Bible has not changed, and it is very clear. Uh, if you want to eat, uh, you need to get to work. Uh, and then uh, seek godly counsel. Proverbs 15, 22 says, Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors they uh, succeed. Now, who are some of those advisors? Just a, a recommendation of three with whom I'm familiar. Uh, Larry Burkett, he is uh, the late Larry Burkett, I should say. I don't believe he is living any longer, but he started Crown Financial Ministries many years ago and uh, developed many of these uh, uh, concepts for Christian uh, financial planning. Ron Blue uh, with Master Your Money. Some of these even have very free resources available uh, online to give you guidance. You say you don't have to even buy a book. If you have access to internet, you can find that. And certainly Dave Ramsey, uh, that, whose chart I shared just a moment ago. Uh, but these can be very helpful as we give thought to this area. It's an area of life that a lot of times people are like, well, you know, you talk about people's money and that's their personal decision and so forth. Yes, it is. But the Bible has a lot to say about it. And we need to be faithful and obedient to all that God's word says about the handling even of uh, our uh, the finances and the, the resources that he provides for us. Uh, now, for just a moment, uh, as I sort of transition here, because this year we're doing something brand new, I've been sharing with folks, and, and in the last two weeks we've had uh, a little brochure uh, like this one. I don't think you have it in the bulletin today, but you can find it uh, throughout the, the church uh, campus. You can find it on in uh, brochure racks and tables, and, and there are copies of these around. It says, Missions First, Our Unified Approach. Uh, initiators must be communicators, and because we've never really uh, given like this before, uh, I want to take some time and just explain it so that everybody understands. Uh, Brother Larry mentioned it a little while ago, but I want to make sure that, that people have a good understanding of, uh, of how we can support uh, the full mission program of our church. Uh, it is, uh, Missions First is, first of all, creative. It's, it's different. It's innovative. It's not the way we've done it before. Uh, it's an approach that is, uh, uh, that's new to us. Many other churches have done it with great success, but we, we are doing it now or, or, or initiating that now. And so because it's new, it requires some explanation. But it's a, it's a creative approach to, to uh, the support of all of these different missions that we've been supporting for years. It is also an extensive approach. It's a comprehensive approach. It, 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 it reaches to all of the uh, different 
missions organizations that we as a church have decided to support. And so there's something, if, 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 you're, if you're like me, you, you want to be a part of, of, of all of that. If, if the church is doing it and it's a good thing to do, then, then why would you not want to be a part of helping every one of these efforts? Why would you just want uh, to do one? This one is, is comprehensive. It's extensive. It's widespread. It helps everything. Uh, it's informative because uh, when we uh, give through 21 different missions organizations, one of the things that we've talked about as we, as we share this with folks is some people have said, well, I didn't know we had 20. We, we've been given t- toward 21 different uh, missions. I, I don't know. I, don't, I know what some of them are, but I don't know what all of them are. And so we have a process. I'll be sharing that with about each of those individual items in, in the days ahead. And we'll even have a missions fair later in the year, Lord willing, where we have an opportunity to meet some of the representatives from these different groups. And so uh, we, we think this will help us to understand all of the mission support that we are about as a church. So it's informative. It's also an opportunity to be consistent. I don't know about you, but some people, uh, let's say they, uh, a- April rolls around or March rolls around, they say, oh yeah, I need to write my check for Annie Armstrong. And then December rolls around and they say, oh yeah, I need to write my check for uh, Lottie Moon. And then at different times throughout the year, we have World Hunger, we have Myers Mallory, we have Disaster Relief, we have uh, the, the Gideons, and we have various different uh, uh, love offerings that we would take and and, and it's just kind of hard to keep up with each one. I don't know about you, but I get kind of, it's just hard to keep up with 21 different things that come at you at different times. But this is a consistent pattern. It's an organized way of supporting all of these at once. And so uh, I want you to see a little bit about how that, how that works. We've talked about uh, our giving uh, through the church and how there's really three main ways that we do that. Uh, the general budget, the offering plate money. If it doesn't say anything else, generally that is church. That's going to support the church. When we give to, through the general budget, that supports having a church. When we give specifically through the designated fund called Forward in Faith, that is supporting our building program. That is supporting the construction that's going on right now. And so that is only going toward construction. So we give to the budget, it, it pays for the church. We give to the Forward in Faith and it pays for the building. We give through missions first, and it supports all of our missions programs. And so that would be uh, the third uh, opportunity for us to uh, designate in our giving toward that. Now, there's, uh, again, 21 different uh, missions organizations, and we've, we've, we've come before, we, you know, we come... Seemed like uh, sometimes every other week we, we, we hand out, pass a plate again, and we say, here's this mission cause. And we tell about it, and we beat that drum, and it just seems like to try to keep up with all 21 of those and, 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 and constantly be, uh, this month we're doing these two, or this, this month we're doing this one, and, and it just gets complex. It gets kind of uh, uh, difficult to keep up with, uh, with all 21 things. Uh, someone said maybe it would be helpful to uh, share this as sort of a, a basket of goods, a basket of missions. Think about it this way. Uh, missions first is like this. You say, I want to give through missions. Well, what am I going to put in my basket? Well, first of all, we'll put Lottie Moon in the basket. So that's there. When I give through missions first, I'm giving, I, I will be supporting Lottie Moon. And I don't, uh, again, I don't, don't need to write straight to Lottie Moon. I, I can write it to missions first. It goes to Lottie Moon. You need to understand it goes through missions first to Lottie Moon. It gets to Lottie. It really does, but, but because Lottie is in the basket of the mission's first basket. Annie Armstrong, we'll, we'll get there. The Ark, we'll get there. Uh, wonderful ministry, helping those with uh, special needs and uh, just a, a great organization. You say, well, I want to I support that. We've been supporting that for years here at the church. Yeah, that's in the basket of goods. What about the care house? Oh, I want to support that. Give through missions first. It will support that. You'll support the care house. Uh, what about uh, disaster relief? I want to I want to help those that ha- when there's a, a tornado or hurricane something. Well, disaster relief give through missions first. See missions first, <clears throat> it it gets it gets all of those. It gets 21 different missions organizations, all of those that we embrace as a church. So that is that is comprehensive that way. As you give through missions first, you're supporting everything. The person says, I want the church to meet all of its missions goals. How do I give to everything? There it is. Missions first. It gives to everything. Now, how do you do that? You can write a check, 
And in this little memo section, you just write missions first. That's all you write is missions first. And it'll go to all 21 of the items in the basket. Uh, now, all you want to do then is write missions first. Now, what you say, what if, what if I don't want to give to everything? I just want to give to one thing. Well, okay. And I just pick Gideon. Gideon's his fine thing to give to. But you can put that in the memo section. And, and there you go. You have one thing in your, in your basket. Now, all you're doing there, you're, you're giving to one to one thing. I love the Gideons. I, I, I want to give to the Gideons through missions first. Give to everything. But, but, the, but if you just do that and put that one name, it'll just go to that one. You, you'll be supporting one thing. You, you're, not doing, you're not helping anybody else, put it that way. You're just doing that one thing. All right, you can put another name on there. Annie Armstrong. You're not helping anybody else. You're just helping Annie Armstrong. Yeah. The Ark. Anything. Name any of those groups. If you just put that that one name of that thing, we will give it in that direction. We're going to honor your wishes there, and it will go uh, directly to that specific thing. But that's all of it. You're not helping anybody else. Now, the one thing, you, but you can do either one of these two. The one thing that you really kind of cannot do is something like this. And we've had this somewhat uh, with a few folks, missions first dash Gideon's. And you see, that, that creates a problem, <clears throat> because, a, 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 an understanding problem. It's a kind of a confusion problem. If you think that missions first is just our whole topic for missions, and you say, well, I want to give through Gideon's, I'm just going to put missions first because that's just a kind of a PR label, but I want to give through, through Gideon's, you're kind of misunderstanding the thing. Missions first is not just a PR label. It's a basket of goods right here. Okay. So when it says missions first, we put it in this basket. If it says Gideon's, we put it in this basket. But if it says missions first, Gideon's, how, how do you do that? Because missions first would go to all 21 of those, according to the spending formula, and Gideon's would go just to Gideon's. So <clears throat> you're going to have to scratch through one of these or the other. You scratch through Gideon's and let it, give it to missions first, or you can scratch through missions first and give it to Gideon's. Either one of these top two are okay, but, but don't put missions first dash and then a specific other individual category or it, it, we just, we, it just creates uh, some confusion there. Um, also, say you, you don't want to write a check. You say, I'm on push pay. And if you haven't done push pay uh, and you are able to handle technology and so forth, you might want to look into push pay. Here's a screen on push pay. And uh, just in a, for illustration purposes, $100. Uh, yes, recurring. This is through uh, Missions First. Uh, you see the fund here is through Missions First. Starts February 20th every month. Yes, set up recurring. Give $100 a month. You can do that and uh, set things up on push pay and, and automatically support missions by $100 every single month if you want to. Or $50 every single month. Or $25 every single month. And you're supporting all 21 missions organizations of the church uh, by doing that. We'll say, well, what happens if I give $100 a month through, uh, through Missions First? If I, if I donate $100 a month through Missions First, how much am I giving annually, for example, to each cause? What am I, how does that kind of break down? This is just for illustrative purposes. You want to look at the, if you look at this brochure and spend a little time with it, you'll see kind of how that breaks down. But if, it, if, if you were to give $100 a month through Missions First, say, I want to support missions on a regular, consistent basis, $100 a month makes $1,200 a year. You take that $1,200 and you do the arithmetic, you'd be giving $360 through Lottie Moon. You'd be giving $144 through Annie Armstrong, $120 through Grace Ministries. That's our benevolence ministries. People come by the church, need assistance with something, and, 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 and we want to be able to kind of help them out in some way. Uh, the youth missions, youth mission trip, taking a trip to Peru this year, uh, but it would support that. Um, Pioneer missions, you'd be supporting by $58. The care house by $58. The Alabama Baptist Children's Home, that's an orphanage, $48 toward that, and so on. All throughout the remainder of our 21 organizations, according to the level of our goals as a church to support each of those organizations throughout the years. So you're... you're supporting every, you're, you're, you're giving to 21 different missions organizations at the same time and supporting the entire mission program of the church. 
with a consistent monthly gift. You say, well, what if you say, oh, I don't want to do $100. I want to do $200. Well, you, do, you just double that. You say, I want to give $50 a month. Well, then you'd be giving $180 through Lottie Moon. So, so you say, well, I, I, I want you to understand that when you give through missions first, you are supporting all of those other causes. It's, uh, that, that's what the entirety of the Missions First Fund is. It's, it's a funding formula that will support all of those at the same time. And so I, I encourage you prayerfully to just think. If, if, if you would say, uh, along with me, I want to support every missions goal the church has set. I want to support everything that we do. Then Missions First would be the, the place for that to go. And then once you decide that, decide, well, what, what can I give on a regular basis? What can I give each month or each week or every, every two weeks, $10, $25, whatever it would be, and you decide that and set it up on a, on a consistent basis, and then we're giving through that all year round, and you don't have to, we don't have to beat the drum for a special time uh, and, and constantly be having these individual drives because we're supporting everything all of the time. So I prayerfully commend that to you and ask you to consider that. I want to ask you at this time to bow your heads and close your eyes as we prepare for a time of commitment and decision this morning. You know, all that we have uh, belongs to God, and that's one of the things that we've really just established. This whole stewardship series is all about the fact that it all belongs to God. And so, in the quietness of this moment right now, I want to invite you to take stock of a few things in your own life and in your own stewardship. First of all, I want you to think about your family and, and the way that you manage things and your household. And, and just ask, am I, am, I, am I handling these things the way that God would have me to handle them? Am I exercising good uh, Christian stewardship? Are there some things I need to do differently? Are there some things I need to pray about? And just lay that before the Lord and ask God to speak to your heart about being a good steward of that which He has given to you. And then I want to ask you also to prayerfully consider the support of all of the missions projects at the church and, 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 and think through what, what you could give through missions. What, what can I do on a consistent monthly basis? Rather than just kind of doing it sporadically or when I think about it or from time to time. What, what, if, you, what if you took missions giving and, and you systematized it and you just built it right into your, uh, your monthly or weekly plan uh, for your giving and, and just ask God to reveal to you what you might do in support of all of these worthy causes that we embrace as a church. Ultimately, the most important thing you can do is to recognize that all that we have belongs to God and who we are belongs to Him and to really put ourselves there to say, I give myself to Jesus in a fresh and special way. And in a moment, we're going to have a, a time of invitation, a time of decision. We're going to sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And if God has spoken to your heart today, been speaking to your heart recently, uh, we'd love to receive you into the life of our church family today. If you feel uh, inclined to do that, we'd, we'd be delighted to welcome you to our church. Maybe you have asked Jesus into your heart, or you want to say, Jesus, I give it all to you. I haven't been living for you, but now I want to give my life to you. And if you're ready to do that, and trust in Christ as your Lord and Savior, I can assure you this, if you are ready to come to Jesus, Jesus is ready to receive you. You can be forgiven of your sins, and if you trust in Christ and turn from your sins and turn to Him for salvation and ask Him to forgive you of your sins and to come into your heart, He'll do that. He'll save your soul. Your name will be written in the Lamb's book of life and you will live forever in heaven with Him and uh, you will be uh, marked as His child because He wants to save those who humble themselves, submit to Him, confess their sin and, and trust in Christ. And maybe today... That's what you would want to do. Whatever spiritual decision you feel led to make today, won't you be faithful to the prompting of God's Spirit and be obedient to what He calls you to do this morning? Father, we give this time of invitation over to you, this time of commitment and surrender. And if there's anyone within the sound of my voice right now 
who needs to make a spiritual decision to give their heart and their life to you today, give them the courage to make that decision and to make it publicly. And we pray this in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. Will you stand as we...